It's a pleasure to come to visit with you this evening. As Jeff said, my name is John Grimes, OSU Extension Beef Coordinator, and we're going to talk about capitalizing on the historic beef economy. So I guess the way I would say it, it's a, it's a good time to talk to you, and basically we're going to be de delivering good news. And uh, that always makes a presentation easier than delivering bad news. So uh, with that said, uh, feel free to type in questions as we go. We'll try to answer those at the end of the presentation uh, for time efficiency reasons. So if, uh, if you would, uh, we'll follow that format and, and we'll proceed. You know, depending on when you cave, I always think this is a beautiful site. Uh, it's a little more challenging in cold weather with snow and cold risk and frost in ears, but uh, you think about all the time and effort we put in towards raising cattle, and, and it is a very long-term long proposition. We'll talk about that in a second, but uh, it's always pretty exciting to see a cow or heifer deliver that first calf and, and get right on it and see the calf setting up and, and hopefully off to a good start. I think that's... Uh, that's pretty rewarding if you're a cow-calf producer. Um, it is a long-term project, as, as we mentioned. Uh, um, if you just add up the days, say today you made it a cow, and um, you know we know gestation is roughly 283 days. Uh, generally, we try to calf females as they're two years or at or around two years of age. So, 365 times two. Uh, for most breed associations, we standardize weaning date at 205 days, and that can vary. But add those all up, and we're talking well over 1,200 days. And so think about the, the time and planning and expenses you put into this project. It's, it's, uh, it's very lengthy, time-consuming, and yes, can be very expensive. Get ahead of myself here. Um, 2014, I, I don't... You talk to any producer of any age, I think uh, this was a year for the ages. And, and you know, we talk about a perfect storm. The, the, literally, the stars and moons all aligned to just an incredible year. First of all, we had the smallest beef cow herd in decades. I believe we also had the smallest calf crop in over 60 years. So from a supply and demand standpoint in the beef industry, we, we were behind the eight ball a little bit. Uh, there were tighter supplies of pork and poultry than anticipated. Of course, many of you are aware of the pork industry. They had the uh, PEDV virus uh, that affected pork production, and there were some reproductive issues in poultry as well. We saw a reduction in corn prices, uh, not so much in the eastern corn belt where we hadn't experienced a level of drought that a lot of places out west, but in many parts of the country, past, pasture conditions improved. But I'm sure the folks in California would maybe not agree with that statement. Uh, even with higher prices, at least to this point, domestic demand has been surprisingly strong. And of course, exports have increased in volume and value. Uh, in fact, today, uh, the value of exports contributes over $300 per head on um, uh, a fat steer price. So it, exports are extremely valuable. Um, so all that rolled together yields record prices. This slide is from Cattle Facts, and it kind of maps profitability for the different sectors of the beef industry. Green's cow calf, blue is stocker, red is the feedlot, and yellow is the packer. And um, you know, I think the, the main story I would like to share with you is I think all all segments of the industry are important to each other. Uh, I know a lot of times the cow calf guy and stockers question uh, uh, how much money the packers making, and if you look at those bar graphs, I don't see too much yellow. On, uh, on those graphs. It's a high-risk industry, a lot of capital investment, and, and so I think those folks, um, those folks have challenges. But in this 15-year period shown in this graph, I think there were six years that all four segments either broke even or, or showed a profit. So, you know, the big question, and I get this all the time, I did a lot of Outlook meetings in the last half of last year, is just how long will this prosperity continue. Uh, Cattle Facts reports that as of January 1, we have approximately 29.5 million beef cows in the country, and we, we increased not quite a half a million cows in calendar year 2014. Uh, what they expect, industry expectations are uh, an increase of 2 to 3 million cows over the next 3 to 5 years. And that's a lot of cows, but in relation to the total herd, uh, 
um, it's still still less than 10%. Uh, at least for 2015, prices will be supported by that small calf crop we had uh, this past year. But there's no question we're going to have more competition from our, our, our competitors' pork and poultry. And exports, at least at this point, uh, still look very good. I, I think we all know that government and, and trade issues can complicate that, but remains to be seen. But we've pretty much experienced continuous 6% growth over the last several years. This is uh, cattle faxes projections for what prices will do uh, through year 2019. And if you look at the look at the graph, of course the blue line is, is calves, it's lightweight feeder calves. The black line would be the heavier weight, six to 800 pound type feeder calves. And then the red line would be fat cattle. Um, notice that they show the peak being in 2015 and uh, a decline starting in 15, ratcheting down to 20, 2019. Now before you panic and you see that downward trend, Please notice that where that bar graph ends at 19, it still would be at the highest prices we've seen prior to 2014. So I don't think all is lost. I think you know there's there's still plenty of room for optimism, and I would keep that in mind as as we go forward. I, I think uh, you know we we can afford we can afford to be a glass half full type of person on this because I think uh, there's lots of optimism. There's there's certain things in our control, and we'll talk about that some tonight. Uh, there's other things out of our control, but uh, at least for the, what I would call the intermediate term, the outlook is very positive. So what's the market telling us? You know, we, we've seen prices over the last 12 to 18 months that we've never seen before, at least in my lifetime. Uh, and in a word, it, it, it's, it's crying for expansion. The market needs more cattle. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, these increased net returns, and, and uh, had a lively discussion with a gentleman over the holidays about uh, how good is it really. Certainly, expenses are high, but we all would, I think most of us would recognize that uh, grain prices have reduced, and um, at least in the last few months, energy costs have, have reduced significantly. And depending on your part of the country, uh, forages have, have, uh, have uh, moderated in price as well. Uh, so to me today, uh, as you go to the barn every day and you manage your herd and what, what you're doing, anything you can do to produce a live, healthy, heavy calf is going to put money in your pocket. I, I don't know how to say it any plainer than that. Uh, you get you get rewarded for head and pounds. It's that way every year, but, it, but it's more so than ever at these prices. I, I think uh, uh, we all would recognize that. And, you know, we'll talk about some different management decisions you can make as we go forward. But I think you really need to consider any inputs that will help you get those uh, higher percent calf crops and heavier calves. Now, I'm not saying you need to do everything. You do, you do need to look at uh, return on your investment. But uh, if there ever was a reason to, to increase pounds and improve the health of your herd, increase conception rates now is the time. So I guess ultimately the question is, where do you want to be down the road? I showed you that graph uh, that maps out kind of the cattle fax projections for um, the next five years. And, and again, if you're not familiar with cattle fax, that is what by most people's standards is the, the uh, most proven sound source of economic information for the beef cattle industry out there. It's, it's a very good group, and, and you get a lot of good information from them. But at the end of the day, they're economists, and we can question whether they're as reliable as a weatherman. Uh, you know, uh, baseball players get in the Hall of Fame if they bat over 300. I think sometimes a weatherman bats about that percentage. But these guys are, are very good, and they have a lot of research to, to base their information on. So to me, I'm, I'm kind of looking at uh, the average producer day is in one of three categories. Um, granted, the average beef producer compared to other forms of agriculture is a little more advanced in age. A lot of beef producers are, are older. Uh, there's not too many young folks getting involved in beef production unless you're part of an existing operation. So maybe your decision is, am I going to continue in the business or am I going to retire? Um, some folks look at these prices that we've been getting as kind of hitting the lottery. You know, if you've been a, a producer for decades, we've not seen prices like this. So, you know, you can't blame somebody if they want to cash in now. I mean, I think that's, that's understandable. 
Secondly, are you comfortable with the size of your operation? Maybe you're happy where you're at. Maybe your resources, your time, your land, whatever, uh, you don't really feel comfortable expanding. Maybe uh, with if you have an off-the-farm job or you have a diversified farming operation, you're where you need to be. So uh, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. So that that's another choice. And then obviously the third 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 answer would be uh, I want to expand. And like I said, the market's encouraging that. Uh, I think there's certainly limitations, uh, especially in this part of the world. Eastern Corn Belt, Ohio, we obviously have a lot of population we have to fight around, and we don't have uh, large open spaces to develop. Uh, you know, if you look at where most of the cows are in this, uh, this great state, uh, it's generally where we can't grain crop. So there's, there's limitations on land, and we'll... We'll uh, look at some of those in a little more, a little more depth. But to me, those are the three categories that most uh, producers are going to fall in. One of those three. So, what kind of changes can you make? Uh, do you want to expand your herd size? Do you want to improve genetics? Uh, you need to improve fence. I know over the years, uh, those of us here in Southern Ohio saw the good work that the Southern Ohio Ag and Community Development Foundation did for folks, allowing them to build some fence. Um, has the weather over the last few years? Uh, made it necessary you're going to have to reseed some pastures. I know wet winters we typically have have been very tough on pastures. Um, we haven't had the drought extent that a lot of other places have had, but uh, maybe it's time we address some of our forage, forage base. Uh, we're going to talk more in depth later about improving cattle handling facilities, and that's obviously going to be a theme of our last session on February 24th uh, with Dr. Monique Paris-Garcia and Dr. Steve Boyles. We're going to talk about handling and and uh, facilities in uh, quite a bit more detail. You know, cattle producers typically don't get new paint fever, but uh, maybe there's some time, uh, some situations, a uh, purchase you've been putting off, maybe a, a new chute or a trailer or, or some type of piece of equipment that would help you with your operation. And again, buy or rent more land. That's, uh, that's always a, a consideration. And, and again, uh, for serious expansion, that's obviously going to be a, a limit factor. Just a little bit about land and we'll move on, but uh, land prices have been trending upward for some time, but it appears the rates of increase might be slowing. This is uh, actually these were 2014 land values, I believe, on July 1 or August 1 last summer, so they might be a little bit different, but uh, you can compare U.S. prices uh, versus Ohio prices, and generally Ohio land prices are, are, are higher than the U.S. average. Uh, there should be some other states, like in the heart of the Corn Belt, like Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, maybe some of the cropland prices we wouldn't be, but we would definitely be in the top cut on, on value of land. And uh, I think it's interesting if you, if you go from state to state, we talk about what's pasture land worth or, or forage land that we, we run our beef enterprises on. And I don't have a detailed economic study on this, but as you talk to, say, a rancher in Kansas or Colorado, and you hear about a lot lower land prices than we have, have, and that's true, but they also have to have quite a bit more acreage to run a cow on per year. Now, you know, our stocking rates may vary from, say, two to four acres. I think I would catch a lot of cow-calf pairs in the state. In other words, two to four acres to run a pair during the grazing season. Well, it's not uncommon out west to, to have the same pair have to run on 25 to 50 acres. So if you do it on a land cost per cow per head basis, um, I don't know that we're at a disadvantage. That sticker shock of the actual cost per acre is a little jarring, but when you break it down per cow, I don't think we're at a, at a major disadvantage. Uh, we are fortunate. We have lots of water. Uh, we Typically, our rainfall is much more significant than other places, but uh, I could counter and argue that maybe some of our forages aren't as desirable as the Great Plains. You know, sometimes the short grasses, native grasses out on the Great Plains uh, don't have some of the production issues that we do with fescue, and we'll talk about fescue in a little more detail as we go along. Okay, you know, tonight we're going to talk about some practices, uh, management practices to help you take advantage of this, uh, this, this good, good economy. And, and uh, you know, let's be honest with ourselves. Ask questions. Why am I not doing something? You know, us that work in extension try to bring research-based information to you on different and new practices that maybe help improve your bottom line. But obviously not every practice is implemented. So, so why is that? You know, there's always skepticism. Maybe you don't believe uh, a practice works. Um, you know, if, 
whether you're in an extension meeting or at a coffee shop, you're going to hear these excuses. Um, I don't have enough labor or time, and that's you know that's that we can debate that. It costs too much. Yes, uh, improvements do cost. You have to figure out if it can pay its way. You know, will the such and such uh, drug or, or feed additive put more pounds on? Well, it may do that, but at what cost? You know, do, do you get return on your investment? Uh, is it too complicated or difficult? We'll debate that a little bit. And I don't have enough facilities. So are these? Is this a reality or are these excuses? I mean, it depends on your perspective. My answer to that is it's both. Some of these are real, and I think some of them are lame excuses, to be honest. Uh, nearly every practice that you see or new technology comes along is based on some level of research. I guess the thing I would question sometimes is the source of that research. You know, as we work for extension, we're still proud that we're an unbiased source of information. And I can tell you that anything that we recommend has to be based on sound, sound research as extension educators. Um, you know, you, you certainly have the prerogative to be from Missouri and ask why or show me. You know, show me why it works or, or know a little more detail behind the numbers that you see. Time is no doubt an issue for the part-time producer. I'd say the large majority of people in the audience tonight listening to this program are part-time producers. So time, uh, depending on your job situation, is obviously uh, obviously a, a, a constraint. Uh, Management practice costs can be variable. There's lots of things we can do that are relatively inexpensive that aren't adopted, and there's other expensive things that aren't, so that aren't adopted either. So um, I'm kind of back and forth on that one. Um, while there are varying degrees of complexity, most practices are achievable. I don't think uh, industry is going to roll out something that's uh, totally impossible to implement. They wouldn't spend years of research dollars and, and, and testing to, to bring out a product that you can't use. I mean, I think anything they bring to the market is, okay, what what can they sell? What what will producers adopt? So I, I think that's, uh, uh, I guess I would look at that maybe more as an excuse. And, and this is, in my humble opinion, uh, in many cases, facilities are lacking and would be the primary contributor to why certain management practices are not adopted. And we'll talk about that in more detail as we move along. So... If you could, how would you change your operation? You know, I'm not saying this is 365 days of Christmas and you're not always going to get your wish here, but uh, what, what are things you could do to make your operation better? And under the current economic uh, climate, maybe that thing you've been putting off, whether it's a purchase of equipment or a new cow or a bull, a better cow or a bull or a new whatever, what improvement could you make now because of improved cash flow? You know, you have to consider that. Um, how would your operation, you know, maybe you don't have a good shoot working system. What could you do differently if you had something that uh, would allow you to easily uh, work your herd, whether it's how many cows you got, how many calves, whatever. I think uh, that's something you should seriously consider. Um, we'll talk about calving season and breeding season in more detail as we go along, but uh, more and more I see a minority of folks have a good place to separate their herd bulls from the cow herd. A lot of bulls in this state run out with the cows 24-7, 365 days a year, and that needs to change. Um, we talk about weaning and preconditioning programs. A lot of times those are not implemented because they don't have an extra pen to put weaned calves. Uh, we've talked about this amongst uh, other educators with beef interest. How, I don't know if I want to know the answer to this question, but how many calves are weaned and sold or sold the day they're weaned because they don't have facilities? Um, I think the day is coming that will change. We talk about feeder calf prices. Can you blame a buyer, a feedlot operator, for wanting calves pre-weaned and preconditioned if they're investing twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a calf? I don't think that's an unreasonable demand with the risk that I mean. You know, death loss is critical no matter what they're worth, but when they're worth $1,500 a head, any percentage of death loss is, is, is devastating. Um, we have, you know, most cases we have adequate water systems out west. It's certainly an issue. If you talk to the folks in California, they worry every day about where they're going to get enough water. Uh, we've done lots of grazing schools over the years that talks about the merits of subdividing pastures and, and rotating pastures. And this time of year, if you don't have a feeding pad, a geotextile cloth feeding pad, 
and you're getting stuck in the mud feeding cows or see cows up to their bellies in mud, might be a time to consider that kind of an addition to your, to your operation. Okay, you know, we're, we're going to be mostly cow-calf producers in this audience and, and um, you know, we can have lots of coffee shop arguments about what breeds the best or, or you know, whether we should emphasize weaning weight, yearling weight, carcass traits, things like that, which breeds would help us get to that point. You have many options. Uh, I think there's upwards towards 100 different breeds in this country. Now, there's obviously... 10 to 15 mainstream breeds that would compri comprise most commercial operations. And each of those breeds have lots of different traits uh, that they, they do better than others, and you have lots of traits to emphasize. But I would contend in any year, but especially now under this market, uh, the two traits that matter the most are reproduction or conception and calving ease. Uh, I, I can make this argument all day long that I don't care um, what your genetics are, if you don't get an animal to conceive and get a live calf, you're not going to pay any bills. And I think, um, you know, if, if we, we concentrate in these two areas, we're going to talk about this here briefly, uh, we can do a lot as far as maybe making up some of this expansion. And we'll talk about that in more detail. But again, reproduction and calving ease, I think, are the two critical areas we really need to focus on at any time, but more so now than ever. So what do you do to improve conception? Uh, and trust me, there are differences, um, just like humans. Uh, some, some animals can conceive easier than others. There's differences. But what do you do to, to document differences and improve the situation? Obviously, one pretty simple one is breeding soundness exams on the bull. I don't expect everybody to, to do it on the farm, but if you're purchasing a bull, I think you ought to demand that. Where you buy your bulls, has he been checked out by a vet? to see if he's producing good quality semen and is able to fertilize a, uh, an, an embryo. Bull to female ratios, as I sell bulls, we always have this discussion, how many cows can a bull handle? And I understand trying to get as many as you can, but at the same time, overworking a bull and getting open cows because you put too many cows with a bull doesn't make sense either. You know, you have this discussion, I've got 40 cows, can one bull cover it? We have to be a pretty healthy, athletic, mature bull to do that. So the cost of a second bull versus a certain percentage of open cows seems to be a pretty easy decision to me. Artificial insemination, uh, we'll talk about percentages later, but a vast majority of uh, beef cows are mated naturally. Uh, heat synchronization, uh, depending on if you artificial inseminate, whether you use that. Uh, there's all kinds of shots that we can use to, to vaccinate for reproductive diseases such as lepto. Body condition scoring is a management practice. It doesn't cost anything. You just have to learn the, the protocol to do it. We've got resources uh, that can teach you how to do that. And then determining pregnancy status. And there's, there's more than just the old palpation way. Uh, you can ultrasound. You can draw blood. So there's three basic ways we can determine pregnancy. And I guess my, my question to you is how many of you are utilizing any or all of these practices? This is a study uh, that was done, um, they call it the NOMS, or National Animal Health uh, Management System study, and this was done, I guess now it's going on seven years. Um, just how many producers utilize these practices? And this, these percentages are reflective of all sizes of producers. It don't matter if you have 10 cows or 1,000 cows. This is the, the average, aggregate average responses. Less than 8% estra use estrus synchronization. Less than 8% artificially breed. 18% palpate of the, you know, small percentage use ultrasound. Obviously that technology is not with every vet practice. Uh, pelvic measurements, again a small number. Body condition scoring, which is something you can do yourself, sitting on a gate post, looking at your cows in the corral. Doesn't require an outside person to come in and do it for you. Less than 15%. BSE, uh, or breeding soundness exam on a bull, less than 20%. Obviously, embryo transfers a small number. But across all producers, did any of you do one or more of these practices? Only 35%. And 
to be to be blunt, it's embarrassing. We we need to do better than that. There's there's three practices there I think that are really uh, imperative that we do. Um, breeding soundness exams on the bulls, palpating or, or pregnancy checking cows, and uh, body condition scoring. And we'll talk about those each in, in more detail. But I think those are all critical practices that we need to do. Relating to conception, um, it's usually a calving season. I, I want you to think about something here. What's the definition of a season? If you use Mother Nature's definition, it's roughly 90 days. Winter, spring, summer, fall, 90 days each, roughly 365 days a year. Um, and we'll talk about calving season here in a little bit. But uh, what factors do you use to choose when you cave? And I would venture to say probably the number one, at least you ask most people if, you, if they're honest, they'll say tradition. That's the way we've always done it. We've always caved in March. That's when we're going to cave. Um, and, and that same NOMS uh, survey shows that the most frequent month across the country to cave is March. It's almost a standard bell curve around March. March is 1st, April 2nd, February and May are pretty close, January is 5th, and then there's a small increase in the fall, September and October. But if you look at a chart that says when most people cave, uh, March would be the number one month. Um, so what are your demands to been, when you cave, uh, how you feed your cows. That, that's obviously a, a dic, uh, deciding factor on when to calve. Um, how much are your nutrient supplies from forages and harvested feed? Um, when you breed the cows, uh, what effects does that have on fertility? And there are seasonal differences, no question. Uh, seasonal differences on calf performance. I'm not sure how much market seasonality we've had over the last two years, but traditionally we have a strong spring market. That's when usually calf prices are high, when people want to turn out on grass. And then time constraints. Obviously, you know, depending on your off-the-farm job or your farming operation, if you're a big-time grain farmer, you probably don't want to calve in April and May or harvest time. You know, those kind of things would be deciding factors. Uh, you know, my challenge to you would say, Probably the two factors I think for most people that you should decide when you cave is one, your personal situation, what's your time and labor constraints, and then probably to me the most important, when can you get the largest percentage of cows bred? Uh, we talk about, uh, I've seen lots of articles in magazines about, and we'll talk about this, about people promoting different times of year to cave. And again, I talked about Mother Nature having a, a pretty good handle on seasons. Uh, this is that same NOM study talking about, uh, it's not really even talking about length of the calving season as much as it is uh, how many seasons do you have. Uh, one calving season, a little over a third, two or more. I know several people, and us included, we have a spring and a fall calving season. And then no set season over half. And I'm here to tell you I do not consider year-round calving a season. It's a management mistake. That's my opinion. And the old phrase, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I just think, and we'll talk here briefly in more detail why that's, that's tough on a management uh, basis in any given cow-calf operation. We talked about time of year, when you can get the most cows bred. And many of you have met or heard Les Anderson, a uh, good friend out at the University of Kentucky, that's uh, done a lot of research on beef cattle and uh, He's uh, trained under Dr. Mike Day here at Ohio State and has done a lot of excellent work on his own. But this is a study that they did at the UK Research Center down at Princeton. And understand that Kentucky would be not much different than most of Ohio in terms of their forage base, a lot of, a lot of fescue. And less, basically in this study they had three 45-day uh, breeding seasons, and there was some overlap here. If you notice the tail end of the first season over, overlaps the beginning of the second one. But look how conception rates change as time goes on. So we get into the heat of the summer. Uh, I don't know of too many people that can absorb a 30% loss in conception from April to August. You know, I see, I've seen a lot of articles promoting calving with Mother Nature, and I get that. I understand that. We want a good environment for that live calf to be born on. Um, April and May are great. We've got lush grass, generally the ground's warming up, but I'm not too interested in breeding cows in June, July, and August. 
because I think you're really losing conception. What you save in live calves being born, you're more than losing in poor conception by trying to breed cows in July and August. Uh, so that would be a consideration on my part. I, I, I got to get them bred and then worry about getting live calves on the ground. Now, obviously, we can't predict the weather in January, February, and March. I really prefer fall calving. Calving in September is about as ideal a day environmentally as far as temperature, warmth of the ground. Uh, and there's trade-offs, trust me. I mean, we worry about flies in warm weather. And uh, unfortunately, here lately, uh, if we uh, don't want to offend any folks in the... Uh, uh, wildlife conservation area, but uh, here lately a threat's been the black-headed buzzards. Uh, they, they are a real threat in certain times of year, so we have to think about those kind of things. But when can you get the cows, the highest percentage of them bred, and also get live calves on the ground? That, to me, that's going to dictate when you should calve. Let's talk about replacement heifers for a little bit. And, and um, I'm sure if we polled the audience, we'd have a lot of different opinions on it, but uh, the most recent census of ag that was conducted in 2012 showed in Ohio that our average cow herd size is roughly 16 and a half cows. And I think if you drive around, there's a lot of lot of herds in that 15 to 25 head range. Um, we talk about replacement rates. National that NOM study that we've quoted before has shown that typically beef producers keep back a little less than 20 percent replacement females to put back in their herd. Um, you know, assuming half the crops heifers, roughly 32 to 36 percent of all heifer calves in this country will serve as replacements at some point. Now, if you look at our numbers and use that same range of percentages, you know, the average guy is keeping, gentleman or lady, is keeping two and a half to three heifers a year. If you've got a 16, 15 to 20 head cow herd, that's kind of the, the range of replacements. How does that compare to what you do? Uh, I mean, Consider what typical year, how many females are you keeping back? Heifers do take a lot of management, and I guess that's something we need to talk about is if you are keeping your own females, are you doing it right? Uh, we've always operated, at least in my extension career, kind of under the assumption that uh, when heifers reach puberty or breeding age, they should be weighing two-thirds of their mature weight. In other words, if you've got a female that can weigh 1,200 pounds as a mature cow, she ought to weigh around 800 pounds at breeding time. As long as I've been in extension, that's kind of the general rule of thumb. Now, there's been a lot of work done recently, especially out in Nebraska, about looking at that target weight concept, and maybe we've been too high on that. Maybe we're actually making our heifers too big. And uh, Dr. Rick Funston at the University of Nebraska and others have done quite a bit of work, and they're actually encouraging us to take that down to 55%. Now, understand, this is, remember earlier when we talked about asking questions about research, uh, the Nebraska research is done in an area with a different grass base than ours. They've got frequent access to uh, byproducts and feed. They've got ready access to corn stalks. So I guess my question is, I'd love to see the Nebraska work replicated in Ohio or Kentucky. Does it translate? I guess I would have some concerns about, my suspicions would be, it'd be a little tougher to pull that off in a fescue-based forage system. Heifers do need to be gaining from the time they're weaned till they breed, but we don't need to make them fat heifers. So generally, one to one and a half pounds a day is a good rate of gain to shoot for. When heifers calve, they should weigh 85% of their mature body weight at calving, and uh, heifers should gain half a pound to a pound a day from breeding to calving. So these are all targets. They talk about target weight concepts. But let's think about that re replacement heifer that's calving sometime this spring. Maybe she's calved now or she's going to calve between now and, and through April. We say she should weigh 85% of her body weight. So she's, and again, I use the example of a 1,200-pound cow, and I think if you don't weigh in your cows, maybe you need to start, whether it's just when you take them to the yards or, or rent a set of scales, but uh, there's a lot of commercial cows out there now that are heavier than 1,200-pound cows. I think it's an eye-opening experience if you weigh your cows. Um, but think about it. She lays down, has that calf. We talked about that picture at the beginning. 85% uh, of her mature weight. So at calving, uh, she's going to weigh, say, roughly 10 and a half. She's laying down, having a calf. She's not through growing. You're asking her to lactate for the first time. If you want to get her rebred to stay on schedule, calving every 12 months, 
she's got to do it in less than 90 days after she calves. Now, one thing for a mature cow to do that, for a young growing heifer, that's a challenge. So I guess the point I'm trying to get at here is I think a lot of us mismanage heifers by running them with the cows. We need to treat them separate. They're a vulnerable animal without a little extra TLC. You know, we talk about calving at two years of age, and there's tons of research that shows if she doesn't calve at two years of age, she's kind of behind the economic eight ball. Uh, you know, I don't care if you're doing an artificial or a natural breeding program. Use high-quality genetics. Use bulls that excel in calving ease and maternal traits. Synchronization is generally viewed as an AI uh, management tool, but you can use synchronization with natural matings as well. And we're going to... If you haven't picked it up, we're going to talk about shortening the calving season, limiting the length of the calving season. And there's lots of management reasons uh, to do that. So I keep coming back to the subject, eating more live calves. Um, again, properly develop those heifers so they're weighing roughly 85% of their mature weight at calving. I don't care if you're using AI or natural service sires. Emphasize calving ease direct, and birth weight EPDs. Research has shown a lot of people think we can't feed these heifers too hard. Uh, you'll cause more calving problems if you get a heifer too fat. I would challenge you to be honest with yourself as you drive around the countryside, how many two-year-olds do you see that are too fat? I would say the guilty culprits would be X4H projects. If they've gone to the county fair, they've probably been fed too much and a little too fat. You can definitely improve calving ease more uh, by breeding the calving ease bulls and you can holding back the energy or protein supplies. Uh, there's been tons of research that's shown that uh, limiting intake prior to calving, in fact, uh, some of you may remember Dr. Ron Bowles, who at least was the beef extension specialist when I started early in my career, he did a research project that showed you can actually increase calving difficulties by limiting feed intake. Uh, and probably the bigger impact is on body condition score. Now think about, and this, this is both for cows and heifers, this concept I'm going to talk about is, is where should a, a cow or heifer be body condition-wise at calving? On a one to nine scale, both heifers and cows need to be in that five to six body condition range, either average or above average. Um, there's lots of research that shows if you're below a five, it really impacts recycling rates, how quick they come back in heat, and uh, definitely reduces... Uh, uh, conception rates. Think about, and I can't quote you the exact time, but basically the, the vast majority of the calf weights put on in the last 60 days. Especially in the last 30 days, they're putting on roughly a pound a day. So if a cow stays at the same weight, 1,200 pounds from, say, mid-gestation in, she's actually losing weight because a lot of her weight is, 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 is calf, uh, body fluids, things like that. So this, this mindset that we have to restrict weight gain and, and condition at calving is actually very counterproductive. I guess that's the thing I want, want to point out, especially for rebreeding rates. I think research has shown that time and time again. So as I talk, um, you know, are you using the tools available to you to ensure calving ease? Uh, do you document birth weights other than, well, I had to pull that calf? I mean, you need to document that, but... Uh, and I guess I would tell you that I am skeptical of tapes. Uh, calf tapes are pretty inaccurate. Uh, there's all kinds of scales out there, whether you use a set of bathroom scales and hold the calf as you weigh yourself, or slings that you've seen that you can suspend the calf and weigh them. Uh, there's, there's tools out there. Uh, going back to herd size and keeping replacement efforts, this is, this is something I really wish we could change, is using a single sire across the entire herd and making that choice based on the heifers. If you buy a bull for those two or three heifers you put back in the herd and you've got 15 other cows, more times than not you're underutilizing your cows. I think we're not putting enough performance on the cows for the sake of those two or three heifers we've put back in the herd. Uh, so think about that. You know, are you giving up too many pounds by using that Cavanese bull on all your herd something to think about. I talked about limiting feed. Uh, I just don't believe that uh, the research backs that up. And still old school, there's a lot of guys who'll buy a bull simply on how he looks. I'll buy a littler bull because he's caving ease, or I'll buy a more slender bull because he's 
he should have lighter cans or, or shape. We've got too many tools today to do it that way, folks. We've got EPDs that can really help us uh, identify ca true calving age genetics. You know, a lot of guys, and, and I know there's folks in the audience that sell bulls, and, and uh, there was a survey done this spring, and, and traditions die hard, but a lot of folks want to know what that actual birth weight was on a bull when they buy him. And I would tell you today is not the best indicator uh, if you're trying to identify calving ease. Uh, birth weights are impacted greatly by environmental factors, how the animal is fed, the temperature. Last winter, we were, I mean, we've already had several calves in our operation, and birth weights are lower this year than they were last year because of weather. You know, as cold as it was last year, they were eating more, just trying to stay warm. Uh, blood flow, reg thermal regulation. Uh, there's research that shows that temperature greatly and in, in feed intake can greatly uh, impact calf weight. Calving ease direct EPDs, and most breeds have these, are an indication of how much assistance you'll be able to expect providing at birth. So you look at that CED number, that's kind of a numerical ranking based on data that breeders have turned in. Did this calf come unassisted? Was it a slight pull? Was it a heavy pull? Was it a C section? Those kind of factors go into that CED rating. And I would contend that birth weight, the actual birth weight EPD is, again, another accurate predictor because those numbers are calculated from calves all over the country, not just Ohio, Montana, wherever. It's a genetic average across a sire's progeny from across the country. So if you're a full-time cow-calf producer, I would ask you, are you willing to do it right? And at least in my, um, you know, my mind, we've talked about some time-tested concepts that will help you maximize the odds of a heifer becoming a productive cow. You know, select your replacement heifers. If you're doing it from in herd or somebody else's herd, select some of the older, heavier calves. Uh, there's lots of research that shows that getting calves born in the early part of the calving season and using those for replacements is an indicator of fertility. If you want to add five heifers to your herd, don't keep five heifers. Keep a few more and be a, a stickler for getting them bred early. You know, if you keep five and one of them straggles out and is 60 days later than the rest of them, to me that's a, a candidate for calling. Um, again, we talked about calving season, but uh, for management purposes, um, I, I'm not sure of the, the benefits of stretching out a calving season. Um, I think a well-developed heifer that's body condition score five to six, if she's bred to a fertile bull or you use fertile semen, there's no reason she shouldn't get bred in three cycles. When you look at a 65-day breeding season, let's assume you time bred AI and you bred them all the first day, uh, you can actually make it a 45-day season and give them three shots of getting bred, the day you time bred them and two comeback cycles. But if you're just using a natural service, uh, a 65-day breeding season will give you three shots getting them bred naturally. Um, and again, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, you really need to manage your replacement heifer separate from the cows until after they have their first calf. How many people can do that? Very few. I understand that. So maybe you need to reevaluate how you add replacement females to your herd. You know, do it differently. Consider something different. Uh, I think we've all seen that definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, maybe you keep your own heifers. You're convinced that your genetics are better than anybody else's and you want to keep them out of your favorite cows. I get that. Um, artificial breed them. Keep the ones that get bred. Have your bull on hand suit the cows. I think that's a good strategy. Uh, we tried this concept several years ago. With some folks, and there are still a couple in the state that do custom heifer development. That was... Uh, that was a tough sell. It seems like producers weren't ready for that concept, but uh, I do know there's some folks still doing it. And maybe the most practical option of all is buy your replacement females. You know, what could you do differently if you weren't keeping two or three heifers? What could you do different with your herd? How would you manage your pasture grasses? Things like that. Um, if you do the AI approach, you are getting them bred to proven Cavanese bulls. If you're using AI stud, proven genetics. Uh, if you send heifers to a, a, an outside source to develop them and you freeze up some of your feed and pasture resources, and if you buy genetics, yes, there are risks. It's, you can add new genetics. You also have the biosecurity risks of bringing in maybe an unwanted disease. So deal with a reputable source. 
Okay. I mean, I think there's ways uh, ways around that, those concerns. So, what can you afford to pay for a bred cow? Now, I, my work with the Ohio Cattlemen's Association, we now have had two replacement female sales. Uh, it's the Friday night after Thanksgiving, and this year we sold roughly 88 females, and they averaged, uh, I don't have the exact number, but roughly 2550 is what we averaged on 88 head of females. Two-thirds of them were bred heifers. A third of them were mature cows. And this is a cattle facts example on what can you afford to pay for a bred cow. And if you read this chart, it's a little busy, but uh, the black bar across the top indicates three levels of cow maintenance cost. How much does it cost you to manage a cow, keep her for the whole year? And that's kind of an acceptable range there of, of current university budgets. And yes, Ohio State, we do have uh, enterprise budgets that can give you some idea of cow costs. The bar down to the left side of the graph indicates calf price, three different levels of calf price. And then you see the assumptions below. In this example, we're going to assume that cow is going to produce seven calves. Your annual cost, whether it's six, seven, or eight hundred dollars, is going to increase three percent a year. Interest rates at six percent, we know those all can fluctuate. And call value, uh, estimating at a dollar four, hundred and four per hundred weight, decreasing one percent a year. So that's the example. So you can poke holes at these figures if you want to. I'd tell you to put your own figures in. But look at the range of prices uh, based on cow costs and calf costs, uh, wildly fluctuated, sixteen hundred to four thousand dollars. So. What's right for me may be different for you in your particular situation and how you can market. So just some food for thought there. I'm not saying it's a gospel, but I think it's from a very reliable source. And I put it in here to make you think about what you can afford to do as we look at a potential expansion. You know, calling is, um, is a subject that, you know, it is a four-letter word, call, and uh, it can be depending on the situation, pleasant or unpleasant. I want to make one important addition to this slide that I obviously left out is as we look at these different factors uh, for culling, age is a very important one. I left that out and I apologize for that, so write that into your handout. And in many cases you may put that at the top of your list, but it would definitely be in the top two or three. So age is a factor, whether they conceived or not. Uh, think about if the cow's open. You know, if you we're expecting her to calve in March, and you get that unpleasant surprise this month. You go out there and see her cycling. You've got another uh, 16 to 18 months before you can get her bred and get her something to sell. Think about the expenses you're going to rack up in that time period. The older I get, I can assure you the disposition gets more important. We all think of those cows that keep things stirred up and more difficult to handle. Uh, calving season. If you don't emphasize others and you've got some problems, uh, you might make that note during calving season if you're having to help a cow, you know, she's got other structure problems that you have to provide assistance. We talk about structure, feet and legs, especially as we study this more, feet are very important. You know, maybe not as important here as it is out west when we have to cover more acres to feed themselves, but foot structure is very important and obviously performance. So you rank those however you want to and I'll, I'll leave you with this phrase. I like to use, you can love your wife, you can love your kids, just don't love your cows. I think that will make culling a lot easier. And I, I'm here to admit to you that I've been a hypocrite on this over the years. Um, in our operation, culling becomes much more difficult if they have a first name. <laughs> if they're ex-show heifers, uh, if they have a tag number, it's a little easier for them to go town. Or if your daughters are at college, then it gets a little easier to cull them. So uh, I think... If you put, I don't care what trait you're emphasizing, whether it's reproduction, performance, weight, uh, whatever, if you are strict on culling, in other words, if you don't forgive a cow for being open or uh, first time she acts bad and tries to go after you, if you call it, think of the improvements you can make over time. It may not be overnight, but if you put pressure on any trait, uh, you, can, you can make significant improvement. I'm particularly interested in genetics, and like we said before, you've got lots of different options available to you. Some people would argue we have as much difference in, inside of breed as we do between breeds. And I think data shows that. We've made a lot of breeds alike. If you go to a big show like Louisville or Denver, basically the barn looks black. There, there's a couple exceptions, Herefords and Charlay, and even Charlays, I guess, have 
black and Herefords have black options. But uh, uh, what I'm saying is uh, we've 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 lost some of our breed diversity. We've made uh, if you look at the data from the Meat Animal Research Center today, uh, Angus cattle compete in growth with nearly every breed, but maybe Charlay. I think Simmentals, uh, Maine on Jews breeds like that. When they came to this country, were known for growth. Um, we put enough emphasis on traits, we've made them a lot the same. But uh, looking at growth breeds, we talked about the continental breeds, maternal breeds, your traditional Angus, Hereford, Red Angus, uh, maybe Shorthorns there. So, so just uh, be honest what uh, options you have. Obviously, we, we raise cattle we like and, and prefer part of its tradition. Uh, but there's different reasons why we choose different breeds to use. Um, you know, we raise purebred cattle in our operation, but I'm here to tell you the commercial beef industry needs crossbreeding. Uh, it needs structured crossbreeding, not haphazard crossbreeding, but, uh, you know, this term heterosis, and, and I'm not sure I totally agree with the term that heterosis is free lunch, but it's a very desirable option to, to add to your operation. Uh, it increases overall production, and research has shown time and time again it does improve fertility and cow longevity. And that's something that's really hard to get at through uh, uh, a purebred. You know, we talked about complementarity. Uh, no breed does everything right, and we need to match strengths and weaknesses. If you like Angus cows, what's the Angus cow need help with? Maybe she needs more muscle. Maybe she needs more growth. So get that from the sire side. Um, so have a plan. Uh, just don't uh, haphazardly um, make matings. To have it, do them with a purpose. You know, the, the value of heterosis, it really helps us with lowly heritable traits. And, and this chart shows that. That uh, And we talked about this in previous bee schools, that uh, the main advantage in, in crossbreeding or heterosis is with reproduction. Typically, fertility and longevity are lowly heritable traits. Conversely, carcass traits are very highly heritable, like ribeye, marbling, things like that. Uh, so we don't get as much advantage on those highly heritable traits from crossbreeding as we do um, on the lowly heritable traits. And I would, I would encourage you to think about our competitors. Think about the hog industry. Uh, what's the typical sow in the hog industry? It's a crossbred maternal-based female. It's generally a crossbred white sow, uh, like a York Land Race cross, something like that. And then they get the meat side from a colored breed or a a meat type line. So I think you know sometimes we can learn from our competition. And again, some of the fundamental principles for animal breeding. Um, the more traits you focus on, uh, the slower progress is. If you want to, you know, we've got proof of this. Think back, those of you who are breeders in, think about the 1980s. What we do, we made cattle big. You know, we wanted them tall. We wanted them right. Think about what the steers looked like at a steer show. Um, and how we've changed in a little over 30 years, how we've changed the look and size of animals. Uh, so you can do that. Um, again, we need a variety of traits because compared to our competition, we have cattle production in wild, wildly varying uh, environments. Guys along the Gulf Coast are worried about different things than guys in Montana and South Dakota. Heat, disease resistance, things like that. You know, like I said, uh, if you've got a very productive environment, maybe you can uh, put a little more emphasis on growth. But those environments that get like 10 inches of rain a year, you need a moderate-sized efficient cow. So, I mean, just think about the various environments that we have. And if you just boil crossbreeding down to its, its basics, you know, say you want to do a Charlay Angus cross. I'm just throwing that out. Would you be more efficient? If your cows were Charlay or your cows were Angus, you can get half breed, half half blood calves either way. What size are your cows? The cows should be moderate framed, moderate size, and get more of your horsepower from the bull. I'd rather feed a 2,500 pound bull and 12 to 1,400 pound cows than 15, 1,600 pound cows. Think about it in that perspective. I, I guess that's why I say match your environment. Think about how you can work with the genetics and against it. And I, I shouldn't do this, but I'll get off on my soapbox on one thing. Think about uh, the crossbreeding we have, especially uh, 
say you're breeding calves for, for club calves at the county fair, you're trying to get these animals that are really thick, really hairy, big boned. That's not my idea of a, a maternal animal. But yet we get half bulls, half heifers, and those are the ones that we put back in the herd. So to me, again, I don't care what trade emphasis you're going on, the cow should be maternal, efficient, and not a real expensive factory to feed. I think I don't care what color she is, what breed you use. Just kind of keep that in mind. I think uh, economically we'll be better off. So what's the main take-home message? Uh, you know, we talked about heterosis in the crossbred cows. So we we increase longevity, we reduce replacement costs, increase chances for profitability. Keep complementarity in mind. Uh, use those continental breeds maybe as more source for our growth genetics and keep the British breeds in mind for maternal uh, and define which breeds suit your environment. You know, uh, if you're producing feeder calves and you want weaning weight, that might require a dip different option than if you're retaining ownership or raising freezer beef. You might want to emphasize carcass traits more if you're on that end of it. So, again, it's not one size fits all. That's one of the beauties of being a cattle breeder. You can do what you want in this industry. Let's talk about forages, and I don't know of any successful beef or dairy producer that's not considered a good, good cattleman that isn't a good forage producer. If you look at this, this picture, I think uh, this is, uh, um, this is uh, a really nice combination of a cool season grass, orchard grass, with a couple clovers, red and white clover. Uh, that gives you some diversity uh, to allow for different conditions. Some forages do better in dry conditions, some do in wet. Uh, get a little added protein from the legumes. If you're making this as hay, uh, you again, you get some of the drying advantages with the grass. So I don't know of too many beef situations that we need a monoculture. You know, maybe all grass pastures, maybe, uh, but I think a, a grass legume mix certainly uh, would be behoove most, most cattle producers. Some facts. Uh, you know, our, our, my co-workers in extension such as Jeff McCutcheon and, and, and Rory Lewandowski and, and Chris Penrose have done all kinds of grazing schools, Cliff Little, about uh, uh, the costs of harvested feed. Anytime you let the animal harvest the feed, it cheapens up our costs. And, you know, we talk about year-round grazing, and I'm not sure unless you've got an exceptional stockpiled situation that you're going to have year-round grazing on a day like today. But in parts of the state, you, you don't. In other parts, you do. But again, stored feed is the single largest budget item we have. You remember that cattle fax graph I showed you earlier with cost between six and 800 Maybe the difference in those, that range of costs is how many days you graze. Um, I feel like we need to have harvested feed. We can have a whole other presentation on, on whether you need to buy your hay or harvest it. And Dr. Bill Weiss is on the, on the last session. will talk about uh, stored forage management. And, and I hope you'll get some good information there. I'm sure you will. But anytime you extend grazing days, you're going to cheapen up your costs. So think about, OK, uh, I would say the average uh, grazing season in Ohio, we're talking usually early April and the month of November sometime, depending on moisture, things like that. If you use annual forages such as oats or rye, or you're able to stockpile a pasture and, and get some extra grazing, just chopping off one month, what would that do to your bottom line? It, it would impact it greatly, I'm, I'm quite sure. What does hay cost? And you know, there's people that argue over extension budgets and things like that, but I think this is fairly accurate. Uh, the cost of, of of grass hay is pegged in um, the issue of uh, ag environmental and development economics budgets. Of course, there's obviously going to be a uh, variation because of yield, but a little over $93 to almost $117 per ton based on yield. And if you would be here to tell me that your costs are a lot less than that, I'd say you're not counting all your costs. I mean, we could argue a few dollars. I, I won't deny that. Obviously, alfalfa is a more expensive crop to produce because of input costs. Seeds more expensive, weed control, disease control, things like that. So just keep that range of prices there for, uh, and again, this is a monoculture situation, all grass, all alfalfa. But you're looking at a little over $90 a ton to over $150 a ton for forages. 
And if you look at hay markets around the state, that probably catches a lot of forage sales in the state. Put some dollars and cents behind this if you look at losses. You think about everything we do we, from the time we cut an acre of hay till we store it, till we feed it, we do nothing but lose it. You know, when we, we rake it, we lose hay. If you tet it, you lose hay. When you're baling it, you're getting leaf shatter. How we store it. And this is some good information from the University of Kentucky we've used historically. Um, even if you put it inside, you're going to get some shrinkage loss, things like that. Um, how you store it outside, whether you put it under a rock base or you cover it with a tarp. But if you, there's all kinds of research that shows if you just take a bale of hay and put it out on sod, you can lose 25 to 35 percent of that hay. Now, take 30 percent loss times $150 a ton hay. That's pretty serious money. That's $45 a ton which I think none of us can afford to lose. I don't have it in this slide set, but there's been research done on just the different types of hay rings. I know uh, uh, Austin Sexton, that he's now with Kansas State Extension when he's at Oklahoma State, did a good study on looking at the different types of hay rings and how much ca cows waste. And actually, we're doing some work on that at Jackson now, looking at uh, processed hay versus unprocessed hay in the same type of hay rings, how much, how much hay are they wasting. You know, we can preserve hay different ways. Like I said, we can put it under roof. You can wrap it. Uh, you can make it as baleage. You can wrap dry hay. You can uh, cover it with a tarp, put it under rock, or a rock underneath it. Uh, there's different ways. And I think we all can think of, think of ways we lose hay. How many times do you drive around and see bales stored at the edge of the field under trees? That is a recipe for significant loss. Hay never dries out. He gets water off, dripping off the leaves. Now I don't know how long this, this hay's been there, but I'm not sure I'd want to take a bale of that out to a cow today when it's 20 degrees and she's getting ready to calve. I wouldn't be happy with it if I was a cow. So uh, just think about those two scenarios. One's wrapped, yes, there's more expense in the plastic, but I guarantee if you're losing... 20 to 40 dollars a ton you can quickly pay for some tarp some plastic and some rock okay so just consider those 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 things i don't want to get into uh, a field i'm not overly qualified to talk about let's talk about marketing uh, i guess to kind of wrap up this presentation um, i guess my concern is we got these high prices you're going to get lulled into a, a, a false sense of security or complacency well anybody can can get twelve fifteen hundred dollars for a calf why do I need to do that why do I need to adopt that practice if I'm getting these high prices well my argument back to that is if I can spend a dollar and make two dollars why wouldn't you do that let's just take creep feeding for example creep feeding itself is a very inefficient practice but if you can put a pound of gain on for a dollar an extra pound of gain for a dollar and you can sell it for two to two fifty I don't understand why you would not do that if you can pay a vet to come palpate a cow for whatever the charge is, five to ten dollars, if you include trip cost, for a blood sample, you can do it for roughly three dollars. How much would that cost save you, or how much would that expense save you in cost if you could identify a cow that was open? I think that's the way you got to look at these inputs: is what can it make me? And yes, there are points of diminishing return. You can spend too much. Um, I briefly mentioned this earlier, but let's talk about preconditioning. I'm not here to, to give a long discussion on different types of vaccines. Dr. Brick will talk about some health concerns here in a minute. But there's, there's lots of data that shows the value of preconditioning. Wean for 45 days before they're purchased. Put yourself in the shoes of the feedlot operator. Think of the risk you're taking buying an untreated calf, a balling calf at the stockyards, and then go to take it to the feedlot. If he increases death loss 1 or 2%, what that means dollars to him is pretty serious. And you can say, well, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not feeding them out. Trust me, if buyer A comes and buys your kids and has a 10% death loss, he won't be back. And they will be able to figure out where those kids came from. You know, I think us as agricultural producers are often too independent, uh, but consider joint marketing kids. Maybe you and a friend down the road use the same genetics, same breeds, you know, um, 
I'm not saying everybody can think this way, but think in 48,000 pound lots, semi-loads. That's what these feedlots want to buy. Now, it's going to be hard for the average producer or group of producers to do that, but any time you can get numbers, you're going to get more buyers. Typically, you're going to get more buyers for your calves. You know, take advantage of what the auction services have, whether it's an independent or a co-op like United Producers. Uh, they're doing some different things, video sales, uh, you know, board sales, things like that, to, to, uh, to increase your chances for marketing. And I guess I think there's, there's lots of anecdotal information that shows that we're kind of evolving away from a commodity production system to more of a targeted specific market. What I mean by that is you'll see branded programs, whether it's certified Angus beef, certified Erford beef, uh, Lord's lean beef, Nolan Ryan's guaranteed tender product. Uh, I think there's somewhere between 75 and 100 USDA certified branded programs out there. Think about how we used to buy beef at the store. It was on a, plastic, or a styrofoam tray wrapped in plastic. And now you see it packaged differently, microwave this or heat and eat type stuff. And in my Outlook meetings, I used uh, this, this example from Dr. Neville Spear, who's been a past speaker at this program. In, in 2008, when we hit the economic downturn in this country, uh, branded beef sales in this country were roughly 8%. This past summer, July 1st, we reached 18%. So we need to do what we can to be low-cost producers, but I think we're going to recognize that beef is a more expensive product to produce than, than poultry and pork. So we need to make sure it's a good product. It, it's, it's free of residues, it's consistent, and you know, I guess my argument would be is whatever you want to produce, whatever breed, whatever type of cattle, just do the best job you can. Be consistent at it and, and implement the practices that we can. I hope this doesn't offend you and it's, it's that the definition of insanity. Uh, I've mentioned before, but just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's right. And uh, I guess that chasing of the bulls will be an example. Just because they've always done it doesn't mean I want to get out in front of a bunch of bulls and let them chase me down the street. So I think we'll wrap it up here and ask you if you got any questions. I see from Sabrina the question came in, and Jeff, if I, if I miss some, maybe help me identify these. What do you consider a heavy calf? Um, I think there's been research that's shown that a cow or a heifer should have be able at the minimum to handle 6 to 7% of their body weight. So obviously uh, an 80-pound calf out of a 1,000-pound cow is too heavy compared to a 13 or 1400 pound cow. So if you think about that stereotype 1,200-pound cow, that would be a 72 to 84-pound calf. That would be average. Okay? Um, and there's calves that are born that weigh 90 pounds that are born unassisted, and there's calves that are born 70 pounds you need to pull. And calf shape, pelvic area of the female, there's all kinds of complications, but I guess to me a heavy calf would be, in my world, would be anything over 90 pounds. One thing I will say, if we talked about differences of calving season, you could make the same mating, the calve in March versus September, and nearly 100% of the time the fall calf will be lighter, the same mating. And that's that blood flow, amount of feed they take in, thermal regulation. When they're trying to keep cool, more of their blood flow is to the outside of the body for cooling. In cold weather like today, they're eating more, they pull more blood flow. So actually there are seasonal differences in the same genetics. John, the question is when should you buy your condition score? Well, I think... It should be more than once a year. I think, you know, you think about when you wean a calf off the cow, they're typically in mid-gestation. So if you identify a cow's thin, the time you need to change body condition is in mid-gestation before the calf starts growing rapidly. If you identify a cow's thin 45 days before she calves, you're not going to get her caught up. So I would, I would body condition score at weaning and sometime between calving and breeding. Yes. Uh, let's go to two that are related. One is how do you measure pelvic area and repeat the question so they can hear it, John. Jeff said one of the questions related to pelvic area, and there's a tool. And again, maybe I should let you answer this question. I think you've done it more than me. But basically, you don't have to be a vet to do it, but you basically take a 
vertical and horizontal measure of the pelvic cavity and figure out in square centimeters or inches that area. Is that accurate? Um, I would say a lot of those times uh, that measurement is done at breeding time or when you're sorting out your replacement effort. Right. It's just to a year of age. Adjusted to a year of age. And uh, you don't necessarily want to keep the biggest pelvic area heifers because research has shown if you're just selecting on pelvic area, you can get creep up in frame size and mature weight. So sometimes moderation is best, but that will help you identify differences. I know when we artificial breed, sometimes you can feel differences. And, but if you want to accurately measure it, there is a device that will spread out and measure the vertical distance and the horizontal distance of the pelvis. Yeah. Related question then is if you select from calving yeast bull, are you selecting for smaller pelvises? <sighs> Consequently, I think they're assuming more calving difficulty. Well, I think there's there's some talk about that now that we, you, in some cases, you can stack too much calving ease on too much calving ease. And I think in harsher environments, there is something to that. If you have a, just take the weather we've had since Christmas. and We've had some pretty cold weather. If you have a 50 to 60 pound calf born on those days, they inherently can be a little weaker, a little less flesh on their bones to, to protect them from the extremes. Um, and I think, yeah, if you, if you went too extreme on calving, you, you could reduce pelvic size. What percent of the cow weight should a cow wean at 205 days? Um, I'd say, Jeff, would, uh, unless you uh, know something different, uh, an ideal target would be 50%. 50 to 60%. Anything above 50% would be really efficient as far as weaning a percent of the cow weight. So think about that. A 1,200-pound cow, 600-pound calf. That would be a pretty impressive pair at weaning. What would a 1,500-pound cow have to have? So we talk about efficiency and moderate cow size. That's a prime example of it. Well, this one's going to get you, John. They want to know what the advantage of having a calving season is. Repeat that question. <laughs> OK. Uh, again, what's the advantage of having a shorter calving season? Um, and I'll speak from experience, and, and I would ask you to think about it. How excited are you at the beginning of the calving season to have that first calf or two? And you. Uh, you do a really good job of watching them close. You're enthusiastic. You're out there checking all the time. Does that enthusiasm level stay up as time goes on? If it's ten below, or if it's if it's ten degrees tonight, how anxious are you going to be to go to the barn in the middle of the night to check one calving? Um, I think there's lots of reasons to narrow up the calving season. I talked about time management. Uh, think about nutrition. If you're a guy that wants to cave around 12 months a year. And think about how their nutritional needs change from trimester to trimester. The needs are great in that last two months before calving and up to breeding season. And if you've got your cow herd spread out, how easy is it going to be to feed them? You know, if you've got them concentrated, say, for example, your cows are in really good shape and you've got some marginal hay, the time to feed that is mid-gestation before their demands get too great, assuming they're in good body condition. If you've got all different stages of production at the same time, somebody's going to suffer. Or if you said, well, I'll just feed good feed all year, then you're going to overfeed some animals. So think about that. If you're going to precondition calves, if you're going to treat them before weaning for different vaccinations for respiratory diseases, if you've got calves running in the same pasture that are 30 days to 250 days, how successful is your vaccination program going to be? If you're going to eat, we talked about lot size of selling feeder calves. If you're going to sell 10 or 100 together, do you want that kind of variation in size and shape? I'd say those are the most compelling reasons to have a short calving season. Uh, for replacements, what should the CED be? Um, I think that's a variable answer. Uh, I'm not as familiar with all breeds, but let's use Angus, for example. I think fairly certain CED, or you know, in other words, not have to get up in the middle of the night, worry about it, unless there's a abnormal presentation, foot back, breach, thing like that. I think uh, double digit, 10 or greater, would be a, a good CED to shoot for. I think, again, that we talked about this single bull use. A mature cow doesn't need to be that extreme. You can put more growth on her. She can handle single digit CED really easy. So 
You say, I've got three heifers and I want to use a 10 or a 12 CED. More than likely, you're not getting enough power or growth on those mature cows. And that's a, that's a prime example of how I say use CED. Okay. Jeff, I'm going to turn it back to you. I assume let's give folks a five-minute break and we'll get Troy on.